That's a hell of a lot of energy in such a short time. That's 4,800 megawatts. To put that in perspective, the Hoover Dam is rated at 2,080 megawatts. So a typical saucer is outputting twice the power of Hoover Dam at full capacity in that first one second burst. And that's, as I said, the minimum output considering that we haven't lost anything significant to the exhaust, if there is an exhaust. You can begin to see why scientists can't buy into UFOs. How do you fit two or possibly many Hoover Dams worth of energy generation apparatus into the space of a few compact cars and show no exhaust or related heat signature? And I have another question. Why even bother? Surely that much acceleration in an atmosphere is uncalled for. If you were visiting a friend and left in your saucer, would you say goodbye and zip off at 100 Gs? That's downright insulting. You should slowly accelerate away, thus signifying the importance of your meeting. That is, you'd like to stay longer because the meeting was enjoyable or important. Zipping off like that is a major faux pas. Proper etiquette demands that you drift away slowly into the sunset. I think Miss Manners would agree with me here. Let's look into a conventional scheme like a super-duper advanced jet engine. We want to push air in the opposite direction in such a way as to conserve linear momentum. Thus, the momentum of the craft and its exhaust are equal but opposite. There can't be any jet wash out one end for this is not observed. We can get round this restriction by pushing lots of air all at once. That is, we grab hold of a whole bunch of air and fling it in the opposite direction all at once. How much air do we need to fling? We have a 10,000 kilogram craft times 100 G's in one direction, so we need to push the air in the opposite direction slowly so it won't be detected as jet exhaust. Let's push it at one tenth of a G. That is, after one second, our chunk of air will have gone just 0.49 meters, or less than two feet. That much motion might not be detected by observers. Then, 10,000 kilograms times 100 g's must equal x number of kilograms times one-tenth of a g. So, x must be 10 million kilograms of air. One cubic meter of air equals 1.3 kilograms, so we need 7.7 .7 million cubic meters of air. 7.7 .7 million cubic meters is about a cube of air 200 meters on a side, more than two football fields on a side. Or let's change the shape to a long stick of air 20 by 20 meters in cross section and 19,000 meters long. That's 19 kilometers. You can see the problem here of pushing off on the air. There is no known way of moving electrically neutral air at all, except like a fan. There is no known way to make an electromagnetic bag to put the air in, in order to fling it. Note here that moving air electrically like they do with those lifter thingies is way too weak and extends only from the negatively charged wire to the positively charged aluminum foil skirt and so can't possibly make a large 200 meter in diameter bag. So if we move less air all at once, it has to move much faster, and it would then be detected as exhaust or directional thrust. Using the air is probably out. Pushing off on the earth is also out when the craft is high up, for if you move parallel to the earth's surface, your thrust vector must be at an angle to the earth's surface giving an upward vector you'd have to push off on the air above the craft to hold it down to a level flight path. And putting out as much as 10 gigawatts for a 200 G acceleration may be thermodynamically impossible for such a small power plant. On the other hand, the first stage of a Saturn V rocket uses 190 gigawatts, though nearly all that energy goes into accelerating the exhaust, and it doesn't melt. 
but then the first stage produces less than 2 g's of acceleration, judging by the rate it appears to take off. A conventional rocket engine propelling our UFO might have to produce several terawatts to get a 200 g acceleration. Forget that. Let's move on to the only other possibility as I presently see it. We want to either create or redirect vectors, or some combination of the two. Imagine a force vector, say, from a gravitational field. If we can create such a field artificially, our craft will fall in that direction. This is the plan of attack favored by some open-minded and or bizarre people. But as Michael Shermer said, your mind should be open, but not so much that your brains fall out. On the other hand, your mind should not be closed so tightly that your brains are squeezed out your ear. If you can artificially create a vector field, you can redirect existing vectors as well. Let's do some redirecting. For the sake of argument, we'll consider that such a redirecting field is indeed possible, though we have no evidence for that at this time. We will redirect the forces in a rotating wheel. Here, in a wheel, we can build up tremendous forces in a conventional manner by spinning it. If we can then do some redirecting, maybe this is the way to get to 100 g accelerations. On one side of the wheel we do nothing. On the other half we redirect vectors both upward and downward alternately. In this way the composite vectors for that side are shorter than the unredirected side and the whole craft slides along in that now unbalanced direction. To hover, we simply redirect all vectors upward, just enough to cancel gravity. To change our angle of attack, we push up on one side and let the wheel precess gyroscopically to the desired direction. To stay hovering in one spot at any angle, our computer adjusts all vectors to accommodate the new attitude. Let's do some math to see if we even have the horses to accomplish this, as yet physically impossible process. We'll take two 1,000 kilogram masses and make a spinning dumbbell configuration with a diameter of 10 meters. Our hypothetical craft is then about 30 to 40 feet in diameter. The two 1,000 kilogram masses are part of the mass of our saucer. We need a force of 10,000 kilograms, which is the total mass of the craft, times 100 g's, which equals 9.8 million newtons to propel our craft as we want it to go. That's the unbalanced force here. So we need a good deal more than that given that our device will not be 100% efficient and we can only use the half of the dumbbell that's on the side in the direction we want to go. Remember we're just looking for ballpark figures here. We're going to have to have our 1000 kilogram weight spinning so that the centrifugal or centripetal force is 1,000 g's because they have to propel the other 90% of the craft. That is, the materials holding it will have to be strong enough to hold a mass of about 1 million kilograms instead of just 1,000. Imagine a cable holding up a 1,000 kilogram mass. Now imagine that same cable holding up 1,000 of those same masses. How fast do we have to spin our dumbbell to get in the ballpark of the required forces? mv squared over r is the centripetal force, and we need 9,800,000 newtons. 1,000 kilograms times v squared over 5 meters equals 200 times v squared equals 9,800,000. So v squared is 49,000, and the velocity ends up being about 221 meters per second. Since our craft is about 31.4 meters in circumference, that translates into about 7 revolutions per second, or 7 hertz.